think I got it. Oh, is it, go is it going? But we don't want it on. Okay. Okay. You hear it? Yeah. Okay. Green light. Yeah. Okay, thank you. One more coming in. Okay, welcome everyone to the Bruce Museum Science Lecture, the first lecture for the Antarctica Science Lecture Series. We have a, a very special speaker tonight. We have Robin Bell coming to us from Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. Uh, I'd like to make a brief advertisement first, if I may. As some of you may know, tomorrow, National Cat Day, <laughs> and <laughs> well, connected <laughs> to to celebrate the, the Bruce Museum. We have started a new program here, the Citizen Science Program. We we have a new Citizen Science Coordinator, Tim Walsh, and he will be uh, organizing a variety of events where people can collect real data for real research programs. And one of the first ones we're starting is Cat Tracker. So we're collaborating with scientists from North Carolina University to GPS collar cats. These are house cats and see how their territory is affected by different factors. So these are our aerial or Google map views of where a cat goes over the course of a week. <laughs> and in, in different environments we see them roaming. These are different cats and so this is um, I, I think this is Toby, maybe. <laughs> they, they each have a name. Um, here's one who was affected by, by a little bit of a lake. And, and here's one who really went on a, a, a wild adventure. Um, it's, it's so what we're doing here is a real research project. We're looking at how the presence or absence of predators like coyotes affect the ranges of domestic cats. And as, as some of you may know, domestic cats are one of the most important predators in suburban ecosystems. They are um, impacting the local fauna in many ways. If you have a cat or have a friend with a cat who is your pet and goes outside, we want your cat's data. <laughs> and we will outfit him or her with a GPS tracker for five days with a little collar. And so I, I have, um, this is the contact information of our citizen science coordinator. I also have cards, so, so please contact me, come up to me after the talk and, and get a card or, or write this information down. We would love to have your participation. This is going to be a real research paper, and so you're contributing actual scientific data, but it's also a lot of fun to see where your cat goes, so, so thank you. And, and, and thank you, Robin, for your patience with our cat announcement. Uh, so, so Dr. Robin Bell is a scientist at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is part of Columbia University. She earned her bachelor's degree at Middlebury University and her PhD at Columbia University and has since done a remarkable volume of research on, on ice sheet dynamics and the relationship between ice and the sub-ice level geology, um, including seven expeditions to Antarctica, several to Greenland, and work right here in the Hudson River estuary. Um, this has resulted in 50, or more than 50, sorry, peer-reviewed publications, and uh, Robin also served as chair of the National Academy of Sciences Polar Research Board. 
Her discoveries include such astounding phenomena as subglacial lakes and a volcano discovered beneath the ice. And so uh, we're in for a, an excellent talk. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Bill. Thank you, Dan. My pleasure to be here tonight. And thank you very much for that lovely introduction. This is how I track where I've been, you know. <laughs> I have a lot of GPSs, but this is where I, how I know how to get back is I look where the, the footprints are. This is actually the um, last expedition. We were up on the very top of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, and the only place you could ever go to get any peace and quiet was to walk to the end of the skiway, which is about a mile. So this was my walk to the end of the skiway, and you walk off to the edge, and then you look, and there's really nothing for about a 1,000 miles. <laughs> it kind of looks just like that. So anyway, that's you know, what I hope to tell you about is I hope you walk away with sort of a sense of what exploration in the pole has been like over the centuries, what it's like now, uh, maybe a little bit about what the evidence that the polar regions are changing, and I'm going to tell you where I'm going this week. So we'll see if I get through that. And if I talk too long, start, stop waiting things. Um, first of all, I'm going to show you a lot of stuff. And you said that I had done a lot, but science Particularly science in the polar regions is not an individual. It's really a, a collaborative effort. You know, I get funding from our tax dollars, both through the National Science Foundation and through NASA to do this work, but I also work with tremendous teams of people from around the world. So I'm here talking, but it's actually, you know, rooms full of people like you who, and as many people as there are here who've helped me do this. Um, this is a, a bad day in East Antarctica. Um, you know, and there have been bad days in sort of going to the polls for a long time. We all know kind of the, the stories of Shackleton, you know, we use him for business school. I don't know why, but uh, Scott, who pushed technology, not always the right way. And then Amundsen, who used classic approaches and got to the pole first. So, you know, these, this era of expedition and exploration was very much driven by getting there and planting the flag was very much driven by nationalistic interests. Um, sure. If, just tell me. Is that better? We'll see. We can try turning it around. That was really bad. We'll try this again. Is that better? Okay, good. Sounds terrible. Okay. So, ooh, can you turn it down? Because if I'm going to have it up here, it's going to be louder. Okay, good. So often those expeditions didn't end well. You know, we ended up with beautiful paintings. I'm a sailor, so I love these pictures. Um, you know, just spectacular paintings, but often things didn't go quite the way you planned. You, know, you end up with your ship frozen in the water. It burns. Um, the dogs run wild. And then you just find the bodies. So, you know, a lot of those early expeditions when you were just pushing to plant the flag didn't turn out very well. Um, and there was one man named Weifrek who'd gone on one of these particularly unsuccessful missions where they went somewhere and they came back not with everybody who they left with. And he started to reflect on it that his name was Weifrek. He was an Austro uh, Austrian. And he said, you know, that we really needed to think about how to change the way we went to the polar regions. That we ne really needed to get observations that had scientific value, that were supported by, I love this one, a long column of value, of figures, i.e. numbers. You know, and it's the only way that we'll be able to furnish us with a picture of the extreme effects of the forces of nature in the Arctic regions. But otherwise, you know, because often we're left completely in the dark. So he put together this concept that to work in the polar regions, you had to work collaboratively that you had to work across the nations. And he put together the first concept of an international polar year that happened in 1882. Um, and <laughs> the high technology at that point was actually coal. That was the big advance. They were actually able to get to the polar regions in a way that they hadn't before. And they made meteorological observations. It was the first time they were able to see the aurora all around the poles. And this really is a theme that continues through polar science today. Um, so that's sort of what it looked like in, 18, in the 1880s. 
just to give you an idea of when that was. That's like when the Brooklyn Bridge was built or they built the, the Eiffel Tower. Just to give you a sense where, <coughs> ooh, where in history this was. And we'll look down. Yeah, can you turn that off? Okay. Um, and then you know, this science sort of moved along. We had a couple wars and then a new technology came around, being able to fly. And in the 1930s, there was yet another big effort to go to the polar regions again, specifically came out of this legacy of how we can't understand the planet unless we work collaboratively. And this time, instead of sort of measuring how thick the ice was, we were very much after the how and why polar regions are changing. And that, <coughs> this is just the, much of the planning took place in China. It's a, the, uh, the skyline in Shanghai. Um, so I want you to walk away understanding there are two poles on our planet. One's a continent, Antarctica. The other one's an ocean, the Arctic. They behave very differently because of that. One, you have um, sea ice, very thin. And the other one, you have great big thick pieces of ice that I'll show you more of. And in Antarctica, there's two big pieces of ice. One, which is below sea level, called West Antarctica, and one that's called East Antarctica. And I'll show you some more of that. Um, this is what we think of when we think of the polar regions. We've seen a lot of pictures of icebergs and glaciers, but really much of the polar regions are like that first picture I showed you, that, that flat white expanse. Um, what we care about today is how much that water is going to go into the ocean. And remember, what we care about is when we're putting new ice cubes in the ocean. We all learned that kind of during Sandy, that it matters when that ice actually ends up in the ocean. The ice sheets have some very, oh good, I found the pointer. The ice sheets, this is what I mean when I say an ice sheet's grounded, it's stuck on the ground. It's like, you know, there used to be an ice sheet here. That ice sheet would have been grounded when there was about a half mile or a mile of ice here. But some of the ice would have been floating out on towards Bermuda, and that probably would have been ice shelf out in front, and then there would have been sea ice and icebergs, just because they're different parts of it. What matters for sea level is when you take ice from the left-hand side of that picture and you move it into the ocean. The icebergs don't matter, the ice shelves don't matter, the sea ice doesn't matter for sea level. The only thing that matters is taking left ice from the left and moving it to the right, if you care about sea level. Um, there's lots of ice floating. We hear about changing sea ice in the Arctic all the time. That ice is floating. That matters for the color of our planet, but it doesn't matter for sea level. That might change our polar vortexes and may change our wind weather, but it doesn't impact where the waves lap down the street because that ice is already in the water. Um, this is really the thing that was emblematic of what scientists think about when they suddenly realize that ice sheets could change faster. Normally we think we have to go out and date them, you know, maybe using carbon-14 dating or counting the layers in it, but when this ice shelf, which was the size of Rhode Island, disappeared, I like to say, between, pretty much between Martin Luther King Day and Valentine's Day, we suddenly realized that things could change faster than we thought they could. You know, and it was a real wake up call to the science community when this happened, that the polar regions and the polar ice sheets could change faster than we thought. Um, there's three of them. Remember, I was gonna bring you back and if nothing else, I'm gonna have you walk away with a sense of what the different ice sheets are and how they're changing. And if somebody asks you what the evidence is, it's not that I believe the ice sheets are changing, it's that I've seen, uh, that I can explain the evidence that tells me that the ice sheets are changing. So Greenland, Greenland's, um, Greenland's beautiful. If you ever have a chance to go, it's gorgeous. But if we let put the gr uh, this water in green, ice in Greenland, in the ocean, sea level would go up, you know, somewhere between 20 and 24 feet. And that's kind of what Florida would look like. Um, if we look at, now we're going to look at the two parts of Antarctica. Um, there's the pointer. There's this one that's called West Antarctica. That's the one that's been in the news a lot because it's the one we think is most susceptible because its bottom is in the ocean. That's where the warm water can get to it. The other one is the one I showed you pictures from East Antarctica. That's kind of like the freezer in your cellar. That's up high. It's really hard to change East Antarctica. But West Antarctica, West Antarctica has about the same amount of ice as Greenland. It's about 19 feet. 
And what's interesting is even since I wrote this article in about 2008, we've changed how we understand sea level goes up. That the world, is, the oceans aren't a bathtub. But, and then East Antarctica, that's the big one. That's where the South Pole is. That's huge. You can see Texas up there. Um, that's a lot of water in East Antarctica, 170 feet. What does that mean? That means that if that ice melted and went into the global oceans, it would come up to the roadway on the Tappan Zee Bridge. So when I drove over here to come here from Lamont, my wheels would have gotten wet. But you know, these, and these things have, that ice sheet's been there for 34 million years. That ice sheet's not going anywhere. But how do we know ice sheets are changing? We actually do this accounting. It's just like your checkbook. We count how much snow is going in. That's how you add mass. And then you either melt it or you dump icebergs in the ocean. That's how you withdraw ice or you withdraw money from the, the global ice account. So that's sort of my schematic of, you know, this is the input, the snow falling on the surface, and then it either melts or it falls in as icebergs. And what we've done is we've figured out a way to track that. And we have three lines of evidence that the ice sheets are changing. And this is, this is the one that, you know, I like to explain to people because it's what we've learned from satellite data. We can see that the edges are dropping. We can see the, and we're in places they're dropping up to 30 to 40 feet a year. We see it, they're speeding up. And then if we do measure how much they weigh from space, turns out you can measure how much they weigh from space, they're losing mass. So those are the three lines of evidence. And I'll actually show you the maps that point out to those. Just you know, if everybody asks you what, you know, do you think the ice sheets are changing? There is evidence, draw, and you can, I like it because you can do it with one waving arm. You can say it's dropping, it's speeding up, and it's losing mass, okay? It's on a diet. So this is, you know, this is, I'm just showing you where it's losing elevation. Blue is where it's dropping. Um, it's dropping in a couple of places at the edge. You know, these are set up to, you know, this is like a foot a year. Places in there are going tens of feet a year. The, the uh, middle is going up a little bit because it's snowing more, but it, the balance is more we're losing. Uh, this is if we measure where it's losing mass. Remember I could, told you you could weigh how much this ice sheet is, and you can see in the same place it's blue, it's losing mass at the edge, even though it's gaining some in the middle. The net balance is the uh, overall the ice sheets are losing mass. And then the same thing, where is it moving faster? Anywhere it's blue or green, it's moving faster than when we start, first started being able to measure it in 2000. So in Greenland, it's very clear. In the same places we see the elevations dropping, it's losing mass, and it's going faster. So that's the evidence for Greenland. Um, very coherent in the same places you see those blue patterns at the edge. So that's what really has us convinced Greenland is changing. Antarctica, we have to look at the two pieces. We have to look at West Antarctica and East Antarctica together. We're again looking where it drops. This is the one that made the headlines in the New York Times this year, this place called Pine Island Bay or the Am Amundsen Sea. It's dropping fast there. It's dropping, you know, the low places, sort of a couple inches a year. Some places it's again up to feet per year it's dropping. Um, and East Antarctica, you can see it's really still up for grabs what's happening. There might be one place it's dropping, but it's kind of hard to tell what's going on in East Antarctica, partially because it, it's big, it doesn't snow much there. It's hard to see any change in the middle of the freezer, as I like to think of it as. Um, it's losing mass, again in the same place. Over here in West Antarctica, you can see this blue blob on the lower left. Again, losing mass, same place we saw it dropping at the edge. Um, and then the, if we looking to see where it's going faster, a little harder to see a strong correlation everywhere except over here in this lower left in Pine Island where again we see things are moving faster. So in Antarctica, um, let's see, do I have a summary slide? Let's see. In Antarctica we have West Antarctica just like Greenland is dropping at the edge, losing mass and speeding up. East Antarctica is less clear. We don't exactly know the mass balance of East Antarctica yet. It's one of the things we're still trying to measure. Um, what does that mean? It means that sea level is going up globally. This is a, um, a map of global sea level uh, for the last, uh, since we've been able to measure it since 1870, we see it's going up faster now. About half of that we think is from melting ice. The other half is from the oceans getting warmer. 
Um, so, you know, about 1.8 millimeters a year is probably coming from the ice sheets. So I'm going to go back to the polar year and tell you what we learned there, just because it's fun. And I often worry that we, we as our scientists, have scared people so much with what the poles are like and the, that the images are frightening. But in fact, there's marvelous things to still be discovered in the polar regions. This is just the, the symbol of the International Polar Year. A friend and I made it on a coffee cup one day. And we were sort of trying to convey we were doing work in both poles, and we were trying to bring the human aspect into it. Um, this was my research engine. Um, I'll tell you more about it, but you know, we put this is, if you ever went to the Arctic, you probably would ride in this with about 14 other people, but we stuff it with equipment, put antennas on the wings, stuff stuff into the tips of the wings to measure the magnetic field. We shoot radiation out these, and we shoot a laser out the bottom. And we learn lots of cool things about the ice. Um, when I, the year I was born, the way they did it, they had to drive across the ice surface, and it was a lot slower. They had to drive these snow vehicles. They took showers maybe once a week. But, the, you know, when they drove across East Antarctica, they were driving, driving, driving. Every one of these is where they set off an explosion. And you can see mostly it was like um, almost two miles thick. It was really thick. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of East Antarctica, when they were getting towards the pole of inaccessibility, they found the ice was really thin. They discovered this mountain range. And nobody had been back there really since 1958 until we went back there during the International Polar Year. So it sits right in the middle of the continent right here. Can't, not, not a single outcrop. This isn't a mountain range you could go hike on. I was hiking on it in that first picture, but you couldn't see anything of it. What you really needed to do is you needed to be able to <coughs> yank that ice sheet off, and this is sort of what I do when I close my eyes at night. I think about yanking the ice sheet off and seeing what's underneath. And this is what we were after. We were after that sort of magical gamberts of mountains. And this is the, you know, remember I told you, we, I'm always very grateful to all the people I work with. And this was a seven nation expedition. We, you know, everybody from the Chinese to the Canadians, the New Zealanders, um, the Japanese, the Germans, and the British. And here's one, one small part of our team standing in front of the British Twin Otter. Um, and here we were going, this is again up on top of the ice sheet, with getting ready to survey. Um, what's interesting though was we were not just looking for mountains, we were also looking for water, because water is really interesting when you're looking at an ice sheet. And the average temperature of that snow is about minus 50. We couldn't go in until it was about minus 40, because airplanes don't work well when it's below minus 40. The, the sealants don't work as well as they're supposed to. So in, we didn't really go into the camp until it was minus 40. But what's remarkable is even though it's really cold at the top, the bottom of the ice sheet actually is melting. There's water at the bottom of the ice sheet, where the, basically the heat from the interior of the Earth is warming the bottom of that ice sheet. It's kind of like if you have an ice cube in your hand, the bottom of that ice cube is going to melt far before the top. And it's because of the heat coming up from your hand into that ice cube. Uh, it's something we've known for a long time. This is a, a notebook from a 1964 expedition across the Antarctic ice sheet, one that they never published the data. So I made my poor child digitize the data in it. Um, we, got a, we, got a, we, we, made, we discovered a lake from it, but what was fun is in the front of this notebook from one of these guys who was a, you know, an undergraduate who was going out to drive across the ice sheet for two months was this lovely little note, Dr. Robin, not Robin, it actually his name was Gordon de Robin. <coughs> but anyway, Dr. Robin thinks there's water at the bottom of the ice sheet. And he, they sort of drew this, if you thought if you, this is what this guy was thinking. I love it. In 1964, he was thinking that there might be water at the bottom of the ice sheet. And because the ice just gets warmer and warmer the deeper you go. What's marvelous is these guys actually drove over a subglacial lake and didn't even know it because they couldn't see it. Um, so I spent a lot of time wondering, what does the water underneath the ice sheet look like? Does it look like this is what a, a cavity at the edge of a, um, an alpine glacier would look like? You could actually walk into it. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, or does it look like sort of um, 
the rivers in Cambridge, England, sort of very placid, slowly moving river? Or does it look like a Adirondack spring, spring melt season? You know, what does it look like underneath the ice sheet? This is one of the things we are really going after is what does the water underneath the ice sheet look like? Or is it really boring and just like this thin film of water? You know, that's kind of, that's not as exciting, is it, right? We all prefer beautiful torrents. No, there's not a single picture out there in the beautiful art gallery of a, the film of water underneath an ice sheet, uh, underneath an ice cube. There are lots of beautiful waterfalls. So it turns out we can actually map the water with that airplane I was showing you. This is what you could call a cross-section of an ice sheet. It's what we see when we shoot our radar at through the ice sheet. The top is the ice surface, so we're flying over somewhere up here and shooting the energy down. So this is kind of like looking at an MRI or an X-ray. Um, here's the ice surface. These are all the layers in the ice sheet. So this ice is about 100,000 years old. This is about 300,000. This is probably about uh, six, 700,000 years old, and who knows? And these are mountains underneath. So each one of these layers was probably a volcanic event or a change in climate that left a record in the ice sheet. So that's most of what an ice sheet looks like. You fly over it, and you see, you see rugged topography underneath, right? So um, sometimes, though, here's just another place where you see the ice surface, you see mountains, you see the layers inside, and then you see this bright, shiny stuff. Well, it turns out that if you if you shoot a radar at water instead of rock, the energy comes screaming back at you. It's kind of like there's a much better reflector. It's kind of like if there was a mirror at the bottom of the, the ice sheet, and I'm getting more energy back. So you can actually see it's making, my, it's making these vertical lines. It's actually saturating my receiver, receiver on the plane. So there's water under there. That was one of the very cool things that we first started to realize probably in the 1970s when we started to fly all over the place. These are places people, as of the year 2000, where people had flown. And they started to realize there were lakes all over the place. Every time there's a little yellow dot, there was water at the bottom of the ice sheet. And what's remarkable is some of them are little, kind of like a, a mill pond, and some of them are huge. They're the size of New Jersey, which is my favorite one. I'm gonna tell you about Lake Vostok that sits right here. Lake Vostok, it's pretty cool because you can actually, s people knew water was there, but it wasn't until we could actually see the top of the ice sheet from space that we could look down and see that um, <laughs> the ice was really flat. See right here, <coughs> right? It's really, really flat. If I told you that that's how you identified an, a lake, you probably very quickly would say, oh my goodness, maybe there's a lake here and here. This is one of these wonderful discoveries I was able to make because it was, Nobody had ever looked at the data. I go, wait a minute, guys, if this is a lake, isn't that a lake? And it turns out those are lakes. But the reason you can see them is that you know if you ski on a glacier, right? Let's see if I can find. Oops, I'm turning the wrong thing. You turn on a ski on a glacier, right? This is skiing in um, Valle Blanc in Chamonix. You can see the ice is really rough because it's, it's going over rock. But if you go up to the Adirondacks and you ski up to Adirondack Pass and you ski on Avalanche, lake, you can see the ice is really flat because that ice is floating. It's just like a mill pond. And that's what's happening here. That the ice here, even though it's two miles thick, is floating like a mill pond. And it turns out that that lake, let's see if we can, is, that's what it looks like at the surface. The Russians built a, built a station there. It's where a very, the very famous ice core <coughs> comes from. And they drilled this ice core all the way through it. And this lake, so this is two miles of ice, and this is about a third of a mile deep. So it's water underneath the ice sheet, captured in a valley. But it's the size of, if I were to drop the US, that it's the size of New Jersey. So it's one of these wonderful things that you know, we've discovered in the last decade. So when we went, as part of the International Polar Year, we had in our mind there was gonna be water underneath the ice sheet. And we were trying to wonder, is it gonna look like big lakes, like Lake Vostok? Is it gonna look like that boring little film of water or is it going to look like something else? So this is where we went. Um, I'll show you some pictures on how we got there. This was um, the camp I went to. It was called Agap South. And this is where my British and um, Australians colleagues went, which is called Agap North. And this is the tippy top of the ice sheet. These camps were both at 
3,500 meters, whereas the dome and the ice sheet's at 4,200 meters. So that's equivalent of being the elevation about 14,000 feet because the atmosphere is thin. Um, and this is what we were after, was what did it look like if we could pick off that ice surface and see what was underneath. So I'm gonna take you through sort of what it looked like. You know, so we really was the goal to go to Antarctica and yank it off to look underneath. Um, and there they are again. There were a lot of challenges. It turns out I hadn't really realized how hard it was gonna be to get enough fuel there. Um, that because I needed about 1,200 gallons of fuel a day, and it was in the middle of the no, it was in the middle of nowhere. Um, and, and, it's, and each C-130 they brought in could only bring in about 3,000 gallons. So it was, that was a challenge. Um, when they said they couldn't do it and they couldn't drive there, um, I asked long enough and they brought me one of these planes. They brought me a C-17, uh, which they filled up with, <laughs> they filled up with pallets of gas and they pushed out the back, but the military's really good at this. They know how to deliver fuel. So they delivered enough fuel for us to survey an area the size of California. Um, they tried to drive gas there. Turns out this, this gang didn't get there. Um, they got hung up in the snow. But this is what the camp ended up looking like. You can see here's the C-130, and this is our little gas station. Oh my goodness, I must have left a, want to make sure you, I don't talk too long. But that's what it, you know, that was what was primed to getting us done. It also with the altitude was a really issue. Um, when we did the survey at Lake Vostok, um, it, we had, ended up having seven medevacs because of the altitude. So we had to be really careful about the high elevation. And it turns out not only do people not perform very well, but um, your, your, <laughs> your um, generators don't work very well. And we also had just plain bad weather sometimes. But we, we ended up having 30 days to do this work because that was the window between when um, the weather got warm enough <laughs> above minus 40 and before the weather started getting bad enough. So in that, I'm just gonna give you an idea of what it, we started to fly. And this is just, I'm just showing you pictures straight out of the field notebooks to give you an idea of what it looked like when we were there. So here's um, Michael Studener who currently runs the Ice Bridge program and is currently flying over Antarctica on a, on a DC-8. And this is my chief engineer, Nick Frearson. And this is, you know, the mountains we started to see. So we actually were seeing those gamberts of mountains, but we started to see some very weird things, like a huge mountain, very pointy, but there was stuff that looked bizarre, like this weirdo thing. Um, we also started to see water. You can see down in the valleys, we were seeing very bright water. And we were seeing the nice layers, but there were these ghosts coming out of the valleys. Something that didn't seem like it was like the normal layers of snow that we'd often seen. Um, and again, here it is. You have water in the valleys and you have these reflectors coming up, almost as if stuff's being added to the bottom of the ice sheet, which isn't the way we think of ice sheets as growing. We think of them growing from the top and then melting at the bottom. So and here's just some more logs you can see. Here's, you know, somebody saying double peaks. I don't know what's going on. There should just be one bottom of the ice sheet and there's this stuff on top of it. Um, then we had an aha, you can see <laughs> Nick, a, Nick having an idea. Sometimes I will say that when you're at elevation, sometimes your ideas are a little wacko. This may have been one that was a little, uh, a little off base. I'm not sure Adrian is buying it. Um, <laughs> But what we did realize was that we were starting to see water in the bottom of all the valleys. So this is a map we actually made when we got out. You can see this beautiful rugged mountain terrain, very similar to the Pyrenees or the Brooks Range, but invisible to uh, if we walked on top of it. But we started to realize there was a connection between those blobby things we were seeing. We made maps of them. That's what we like to do. We make, you know, remember how we saw the maps of the cats? Well, we like to map where things go to. So, so this is all those beautiful valleys, very dendritic, familiar looking landscape. And then there were these, this odd stuff, these orange blobs is what we count, called them at that point. Stuff that looked like it was being added onto the bottom of the ice sheet. And what we eventually realized when we put together where there was water, and so that's where everywhere we saw water, you can see the waters in the valleys, all the green dots are where there's water. And then we looked to see where um, the water was flowing. We realized the water was getting, 
this one took us a long time to get our heads around because it seems like so totally improbable. But we realized the water was getting driven uphill. Right? It seems like a dumb idea, but when you have an ice sheet like this, and you put a river like this, and you put an ice sheet on top, there's less pressure at the end of my fingers than at my elbows. So the water is going to get driven uphill. So we found these rivers that were flowing backwards underneath the ice sheet. And that's where this free, the, where at the end of all these <laughs> rivers flowing backwards, we found these blobs of ice where the water was refreezing to the bottom of the ice sheet, almost like the ice sheets were behaving backwards in the middle of the ice sheet. Um, and this is, <laughs> this is the process called supercooling. It's, it's happening, you're moving the water up fast enough and then it snap freezes. So this is an experiment we did with a bottle of soda that's been in the freezer long enough but hasn't frozen yet. And it's really kind of fun. It took us a long time to master this, which means it doesn't happen everywhere. What, what you're going to do is just take the top off the bottle of the seltzer, and you're changing its pressure. It's kind of like you're driving it up that hill. You're releasing its pressure. And when you move that cold water to a new pressure regime, it instantly freezes. So this is what you, <laughs> if you practice a lot, you can do this with a bottle of seltzer. <laughs> or the planet does it with much more grace than we do it <laughs> at the bottom of the ice sheet where you have water being driven uphill until the ice sheet gets thinner and you freeze it on it. Isn't that cool? It took us a long time to get this. We, we went through a lot of soda, <laughs> seltzer, to get this one. Um, so this is what we thought. And, you know, sometimes in science you do these things and people tell you you're wacko, you're crazy. You're going in the wrong place. And I showed you before how all the change in the ice sheets is happening around the edges. And a lot of my colleagues said, why are you going to the middle of the ice sheet? Isn't that the wrong place to go? We only need to be looking at the edge of the ice sheet, because that's where it's changing. Well, I continue to argue with them that we, there are places and things we need to understand. And if we don't go to new places, we aren't going to understand what's going on, just like those very early explorers didn't learn new things unless they went somewhere new. So we've discovered this water running uphill and freezing onto the bottom of the ice sheet, but you know, scientists are fairly pig-headed, myself included. Um, and so a lot of my colleagues thought, oh yeah, Robin, that's cool. You know, what you found in the middle of Antarctica probably doesn't matter, right? Because that's, like, that's something that happens in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> until we started to look at the radar data from Greenland. So here's the ones I just showed you from Antarctica, where you saw water getting driven uphill and freezing onto the bottom of the ice sheet at the mountain ridges. And look what you see in Greenland. It looks almost the same. And guess what? They're all, if we go to Greenland, I'm going to look at the top. I mean, now I'm going to just walk you through what they look like, just because they're beautiful. Again, we're looking at the bottom of the Greenland ice sheet. We're kind of flying through it. And you see these same tremendously, you know, quarter mile tall structures growing. And when you look over northern Greenland, they're all over the place. Every time there's a little black dot is somewhere where we found one of these same structures that we found in the middle of nowhere in <laughs> Antarctica. We found them in Greenland. And then when we look at those, I'm going to show you a couple of these radar profiles just to show you what beautiful things they are. You know, they're, they're spectacular structures where you see the ice sheet. You know how sometimes you walk around, you see the old rocks around here folded and bent? Or if you were to go into the exhibit here and see um, metamorphosed rocks. These are pretty much metamorphosed rocks. It just happens to be ice, and we just happen to be able to see it. So you can see things that are bent over. You can see things that are totally deformed, um, kicked up. Some of this is freezing. Some of this is deformation. Um, just these beautiful kind of tours inside the structures inside the ice sheet. And what's remarkable is that we're starting to understand that what we went to the middle of nowhere, the top of the ice sheet to understand, is controlling how the ice sheet's flowing. I'm going to show you a little video. This time it's not a bottle of soda. It's actually a model of how the ice sheet behaves where my graduate student, Mike Volovic, was trying to reproduce how these might happen. And so he let a little water go in at the edge, and the ice sheet starts to slide fast and crash into the front of it, the ice in front of it. And then it starts to warm and deform and make those spectacular patterns. And then it does it again. And then it actually makes the ice sheet, we're going to see it 
flip right here in a minute and go fast. It's gonna, it actually can make the ice sheet pulse, this little addition of water and the deformation. It's kind of looking at a new part of the ice sheet to understand how it works and how it flows towards the ocean. Um, so um, that's just to give you an idea of what we've been working on and how I like to think that we're in an age of exploration in the polar regions where we're driven by trying to, to understand how it's changing, but we're driven by trying to understand the processes. Whereas we used to be driven to plant flags, we're now trying to understand how things change. So I thought I'd take, one of the stories it turns out we learned after I showed you pushing all that fuel out the back of the C-130 and the C-17 is I got home and it turns out the New York Air National Guard were the people who were flying those C-130s into the um, field camp we were at. And they came up to me and they said, you know, if you could have put your instruments on our plane, all the flights we took to give you fuel, we could have done your science. And it's like, hmm, that's a cool idea. But guess what? They don't, you know, the US military does not want me to drill holes in their planes. You know, it's just not something they like to do. But it turns out that, you know, some of the wonderful things that have come out of um, all the military exercises we've been in, if they want to take these kind of planes and quickly make them into imaging planes. I don't know what they're imaging, and I do know they have a gun thing on the other side that I have nothing to do with. But it meant that there was this way that I could, they said, look, we have this pod, and we can pop it on any plane. We can turn any plane I, we have into a research machine in three hours. So we wrote a Recovery Act proposal to get funding to build this, what we now call ice pod. And here's a, this is kind of like my, I do have kids. I will show you my kids' pictures too. This is my science baby. Um, this is my ice pod. This is looking out of it this summer in Greenland down over. This is the calving front in Greenland. Uh, and this is where we're actually taking data out of the ice pod. And this is where uh, meltwater from underneath the ice sheet is coming up in the fjord. It's just this spectacular process of how the, hydro the water systems on the top, the bottom, and the edge of the ice sheet are all linked together. So. Why does that matter? It does matter because, yeah, sea level is going up. Um, these are my two favorite. I thought I would show the battery just because I like to think of that one. You know, this is when my, uh, this is when my grandmother was born and she was driving a, um, a, uh, a cart and buggy. And, you know, this is about where my grandfather was driving around in, um, in a Model T during World War I, and here's my, my father and his triumph in the 1950s, and this is where I had a Mitsubishi and I now have a Prius. Um, so, <laughs> since, so basically, since my grandmother started driving her um, <coughs> horse and buggy, she liked horses a lot. I like to think, just put your hand about halfway up your leg. That's how far she was. And really what we're trying to under, understand is, you know, in the next hundred years, will it go, is it going to go up my way? That's really what we're trying to understand is what are the processes that are making it and what are the things that make the ice sheet go pulse? Because, you know, the sea level's been going up for a while and it's going to keep on going up. Um, I just thought I'd throw King's Point on just, you know, this is the battery. It's actually this funny little shed if you were to go down um, to take the Staten Island Ferry. There's a little shed there that's, believe it or not, been measuring since the 1800s. And there's a similar one over in Kings Point. And you can see this, it's about the same rate it's going up, about a tenth of an inch a year. So, you know, I like to think of it as, you know, we as humans have lived with this for a while, and we're clever. We're going to figure out how to adapt to this. Um, so, you know, what, what, do we, what do I think we need to do next? I think we need to start exploring this part and in, in this especially important because what we think is happening we think is the ocean warming is coming in like this and when the warm ocean water comes in that's what helps make the ice sheet go faster and then if you remove one of these ice shelves as they're called we have all these terrible languages but it actually does mean something this ice has gone afloat this is in the ocean this is still stuck on the ground. It's not affecting sea level. When you kind of cross this magic line, this ice is suddenly influencing sea level. 
so that's what we care about and we can make this go faster by greasing one of these roads or we can make it go faster by yanking away this ice shelf so what we're going to do um, is one big ice shelf left in Antarctica it's right here it's called the Ross ice shelf it's right next to where McMurdo is so what it's the size of France and <laughs> It's huge. It's holding back this whole ice sheet. So this is the West Antarctic ice sheet. Remember, we heard about it at the beginning. Um, and this is how fast the ice is flowing across it. And the, every one of those dots is where, in the 1970s, they set off explosives. And they figured out how deep the water is. Here's how deep the water is. What we don't, what it turns out, it's way more important to know how the water is getting in there. We didn't know in the 1970s it was that important. So we're gonna take the ice pod that I showed you that we made, that we tested this year in Greenland. Actually, I leave on Thursday. And we're gonna take it down to McMurdo with this team of people, sort of the combination of the New York Air National Guard and the, the scientific team from Lamont. And we're gonna actually gonna start seeing if we can understand how that warm water is getting underneath the Ross ice shelf and what are the things we can explore and learn about how the ice sheets are changing. So really, I'd I hope to leave you with a sense that uh, there's still a lot of exploration going on in the polar regions. And really what we're trying to do is push past just mapping and saying things are changing, but actually trying to understand the how and the why, because it's really important that we understand how our planet is changing. and. Really, just stay tuned, because I think we're going to learn some cool new things, and we're eventually going to be able to say better how fast things will change in the future. So with that, I think I'll say thank you very much, and take your questions. Do you wanna Could we have the lights up, please? Thank you. So. Uh, Everyone hopefully heard Dr. Bell is going to Antarctica on Thursday, and today is Tuesday. So let's thank her again for coming and speaking with us. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, we have time for some questions if anyone would like to ask. Take it, sorry. Okay, so the question is, what's making the ocean warm? And I just thought I'd start with Greenland, because Greenland's the easier one to start with. In Greenland, there, it's half melting and half sliding into the ocean be because it's warmer. So there, well, that's what I'm gonna tell you, because that's a really good question. In Greenland, the air is warmer because we've warmed the air globally. That's pretty, and that's why the surface melt is happening. And that warmth is getting into the global oceans slowly. Actually, a lot of the um, heat's being absorbed by the ocean, so that's why the oceans are warming. In Antarctica, it, it's the same thing in that we've, it, in that the ice is flowing faster because there's warm water up next, and it's like chewing away at that critical little point, and we're breaking up those. Whenever we break up one of those ice shelves, the ice flows faster because that ice shelf is kind of holding back. So it's um, the warming atmosphere is putting more heat into the ocean. And then there are other complicated pieces like the winds are blowing stronger because we've changed the temperature gradient between on top of the pole and the tropics. And those stronger winds are making more warm water up close to the ice sheet. So it's not, you're, it's a really good question. It's actually one we're still working on. Well, it depends which answer you want. Do you want to answer why the, you know, why the ice sheets are changing or how they're going to change in the future? Yeah. Well, you're changing the temperature. You've changed the amount of 
incoming radiation you're capturing. So you're increasing the, the global temperature. That's in warm, melting the ice surface in Greenland, and that heat is going into the ocean. It's that ocean water. Here, we'll go back and look at the cross section. Maybe that'll help because it's good to have a, see if I can get one that, um, this is a good one. What you're, you know, if you warm this ocean, there's two ways to make the ice sheet go really fast. One is to take away this ice shelf. That's why we care about the Ross Ice Shelf so much, because if you take away that ice shelf, those rivers of ice behind it no longer have that block. Or you can just melt it here and drive this place it goes afloat inland. So any other, any other questions? Yes. It's, it's in beautiful water. It's, um, it's more, it's uh, cleaner than distilled water. Yeah, you can see that brown, oh, I think it's really close in the pictures. So this water over here is um, salty. And this brown stuff started off on the ice surface, so that's totally fresh. And it, but it's coming rushing to the surface because it's more buoyant, because it's fresh. You know, fresh water will f is less dense than salt water. And there is a question of is, you know, it is probably not enough yet to really cause a, a significant freshening, but it is something people are looking at is will more water cause, uh, more meltwater cause a freshening? Yes? Um, there is, you know, there, there was in Rolling Stone, a colleague of mine who wrote an article called um, Dark Ice, Black Snow. He has a, um, he thinks it's, he thinks a lot of the melting's because of increased particulates on top of the ice sheet. I think he's, I don't think he's right, but you know, that's what science is. Science is arguing about these, you know, what is it, and trying to look for the sequence in what thing's happening, trying to find out if you can find coal, you know, coal dust or coal ash, the chemicals that reflect particles in the snow at the right time of year. So those are the kind of things we are, you know, they're being actively worked on is what's making that more melt. Is it simply the surface temperature or are we changing the color of the ice? So here, in the back. Oh. Mm -hmm. oil, yep. 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 Antarctica is remarkable because Antarctica is the site of the first environmental global environmental treaty that we signed. It was called the Antarctic Treaty, and it set Antarctica aside for science, with the con idea that at least for the next 50 years that we would not do any exploitation of the minerals and the gas. That's less than 35 years and people are starting, to, you know, in, it's getting to be close enough, i.e. it's about 30 years till it's, that ban's released, that people are starting to explore. You see, you see seismic ships going around Antarctica. Um, it's not clear that we have the technology to get it out yet, but everything that you see in Australia and South Africa is in Antarctica in terms of resources. There are rich mineral resources. Greenland's the same. Greenland's uh, geologically the same as Canada. Anything you find geologically in Canada, you're likely to find in Greenland. And Gre Greenland's, you know, Greenland's an interesting place because they have a small population, but they have, the climate is, will bring them both change, but will bring them more wealth because they will likely exploit their resources. Yes. Right. That's a really good question. Um, one thing is that, um, let's see if I can find a map. Okay, can, are you guys all right with this upside down map? <coughs> so, okay, what we know, you know, we go there, 
people at Lamont who look at paleoclimate, they use either ice or sediments to say what's sea level, oh, sea level been in the past? Whose idea was this? Um, we'll find another map of Antarctica um, where we don't have to jump all the time. We will just go this way. Um, one of the interesting questions is how, um, nope, we need to go further back, whether or not West Antarctica will change because it's below sea level, and then um, I just need a map of Antarctica, guys. Um, so let me find you one. Okay, we will just go with this one. Um, East Antarctica sits higher. You can see it in this image really nicely. It sits higher. It's it's further south. West Antarctica is changing because it sits it sticks further north. You know, as I like to think of it, Greenland. Look how far south Greenland is. Greenland's sticking its nose right out into the middle of the Atlantic. Of course, it's going to get warm and change first. This part of Antarctica is the part of the peninsula, the place that if most of you guys have been to Antarctica, that's probably where you've been. This is the place where the temperatures are changing the most, again, because it's the furthest north part of Antarctica. This is the most isolated. We do think parts of this have gone last time, you know, in previous interglacials. You know, we're living in what's called the, remember this place, you, this being the Bruce Museum, used to be covered with ice, you know, 20,000 years ago, there was ice here. Um, 120,000 years, there was ice here too. Um, the 100,000 years, we think maybe part of Antarctica went, this East Antarctica went, because there are beaches that are higher than we can explain by making Antarctica and West, ah, Greenland and West Antarctica go away. So we think, even though now we don't see a lot of change, we think it's possible for East Antarctica change. That was a long answer to your question. Yes. The top of the ice sheet's 4,200 meters. So multiply by three, roughly, to get, yeah, yeah. Um, that's just the top of the ice sheet. That's the mountains are, the actual mountain, they're actually taller mountains, but that's the top of the ice sheet. And that's, you know, that's where the ice is sitting on top of the gamberts of mountains, yes? Um, research for, do you know of any You mean the polar vortex here or the polar jet in Antarctica? Yes, there's a lot of people worrying about it because it's really complicated because um, in the mix is the fact that there's an ozone hole and the ozone hole is also helping increase those winds. So there's two things that are increasing the winds around Antarctica, or so we think. One is the ozone hole because again, you've changed the gradient in the chemistry and temperature of the upper atmosphere. And the other one is this longer wavelength change between the very cold pole and the warming tropics. So yeah, people are worrying about that a lot because to make Antarctica change, you looks like you have to increase the winds and to, to get that, won't remember, she, she, want, she asked about the warm waters, to get the warm waters up, you need your answer, which is the stronger winds. And the answer, question is, we're still working on trying to understand why the winds are stronger. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Is my math correct that sea level is therefore at this present rate rising one inch every 10 years? Uh -huh. Okay. So just to put it in greater perspective, when you were using Florida as an example, right. how long would it take at the present rate for Florida to be underwater? I haven't done those calculations. I know. What's yeah. your um, you know, okay, I'm going to answer by telling you how complex the problem is, and you're going to hate that as an answer, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway. When I wrote this article, ten, you know, this was a Scientific American article, I showed you the pictures from 10 years ago. Um, we still thought water went up like a bath, that the oceans were like a bathtub, right? And water, we put water in, it was just like an ice cube, right? We'd throw an ice cube in and the water would go up. And this is just to explain to you how fast the science is moving, our understanding of the planet's moving forward. Well, it turns out that there's a gravitational attraction of the ocean <laughs> to the ice sheets, right? I know. 
So actually the ISIS, if I, he was the Greenland ice sheet, there would actually be water piled up next to him. So it turns out for us, Greenland doesn't matter as much because we're kind of in that bulge of where our sea level's a little higher already because of Greenland. What matters for us is West Antarctica um, because th when that goes, it's pretty much a straight impact for us. So um, I don't want to say, I'm not comfortable saying how long till Florida's flooded because we don't know. We don't know, we don't, we're learning so fast. We're learning that the ocean isn't as flat as we thought it was. And we're learning that there are things that can make the ice sheet pulse in a way that we didn't know. This is what I mean, it's just this, it's not all scary, it's a wonder of our planet. It's like looking up at the stars. This, we're just beginning to look at the polar regions and understanding how wonderfully they change. And, you know, they're, they're beautiful, but they change. Yes? Mm -hmm. Probably more in the Arctic than in the Antarctic, just because um, <laughs> should you ever go to both Greenland and Antarctica, this is what totally, this is an anecdote, but it'll tell you the same thing, is that when you go to Antarctica and you get up next to the ice sheet, it kind of looks like these pictures, right? Or my pictures, right? There is ice and rock, right? not a lot of stuff to make methane out of, right? You need some biological activity to make methane. You go to Greenland, oh my God, it's gorgeous. You have flowers and caribou and muskox right up next to the ice sheet. So the methane question is a much more serious question in the north than it is in the south. You don't have the same type of biological activity on the continents that in the south that you do in the north. You know, when we find my friends who study in the Dry Valley have, you know, their giant high lever predatodes or nematodes, right? Things you find in your garden, little worms. So there's just not the same production of methane happening in Antarctica. Other questions? Yes. <laughs> you mean in Lake Vostok? When I first went there, my kids were a little younger and my son made me promise that I, w he decided that that's where the Hitchhiker's Galaxy Dolphins had their lab, and he was convinced that I was going to hurt the dolphins. And I had to promise him that I really wasn't going to hurt the dolphins if they live there. Um, they're microbes. You know, they've, every time they've sampled either the ice that's frozen on to the bottom of the lake or to one of the, I didn't show you, but I have a friend who discovered these lakes that are like cascading lakes. They go from one to another to another, and we can see them because the ice, when one drains, the ice goes whap. And you can see that from space. When they sampled one of those, they found microbes and microbes that can live <laughs> without a lot of solar energy. Um, but th there's probably not, who knows, I shouldn't say this. Remember, there's that beautiful exhibit of the tube worms and people used to think nothing lived in mid-ocean ridges. Perhaps if there was a, you know, a source of energy, such as a, a thermal vent, you might find something. But so far, we've mostly find mi found microbes, no dolphins. <laughs> so, other questions? Yes. I have I'm another friend, another Lamont graduate, graduate named Terry Wilson, who spent the last decade putting GPS sites out on all the rocks around Antarctica. <coughs> she used to be a geologist, and she then realized there was like so little rock in Antarctica that maybe she should start doing geophysics. I thought it was a good idea being a geophysicist. But what she's doing is she's taking very precise GPS and putting them on rocks, and she's actually measuring how the ice sheets bouncing, so how, the, how the solid earth is bouncing. And you guys know that that's why like Maine and Scandinavia are rocky shores. That's because those are, those are still bouncing from the last ice age. You know, Scandinavia, there's some places in the earth where sea level isn't going up because the earth is going up. So Scandinavia, it's still going up about that much, up to a centimeter a year because used, the ice sheet was right in the center. So that's why the, 
beaches are rocky, there's been no chance to like gather the sand. So right now they're, they're seeing less than, a, you know, it's not quite that dramatic in Antarctica, but they are able to, they do those measurements to try and figure out what the last, mass, last most recent mass change has been. And they do think they've seen some bouncing from where recently it's accelerated. So it is a way of sort of, you know, we think of taking a pulse of a human to know what's going on, but our planet has a pulse too where we can actually see it go up and down when we change the ice load on top of it. Yes? So which so say that one. What what do you want? What's brine. the brine? Mm, probably not. Those it turns out those lakes are pretty fresh. We used to <coughs> before they sampled them. We were wondering whether or not they might be briny, just because uh, the water has been going in them for so ever long, and the water that comes out is pretty clean. But it looks it turns out that they're um, they're pretty fresh. So we don't think there's any brine in those. But there could be brine. There the lakes in the dry valleys. There are briny lakes in Antarctica. So some of them do have brine. So that, shall we declare? OK, good. So, so, oh, so thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, all, one more round of applause, please. Thank you so much for speaking. Uh, I will plug the cat project one more time. I have a, a stack of cards for those interested in cats. So. No. <laughs> Remember, tomorrow's cat, everybody should celebrate tomorrow with National Cat Day.